Good morning. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, professor of obstetrics and gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. My title today is Benign Lesions of the Uterus. So what we wanted to discuss today, the anatomy of the uterus and the cervix, cervical ectrobium, Nabuthian follicles, cervical polyps, cervical stenosis, endometrial polyps, Asherman syndrome, adenomyosis. Let us start with the anatomical structure. The uterus is a sick wall muscular organ capable of expansion to accommodate growing fetus. It is connected distally to the vagina and laterally to the uterine tubes on both sides. The uterus has three parts, fundus, body, and the cervix. The cervix lower part of the uterus linking it with the vagina. This part is structurally and functionally different to the rest of the uterus. So, what about the cervix? The cervix is formed of ectocervix and the endocervix. The ectocervix is the portion of the cervix that projects into the vagina. It is lined by stratified squamous epithelium and the non keratinized one. The opening of the external os marks the transition from the ectocervix to endocervix. So this is the external os which open to the endocervix. What about the endocervix? This is the endocervix, the cervical canal is more proximal and the inner part of the cervix it is lined by mucus secreting simple columnar epithelium. The endocervical canal ends at the uterine cavity, begins at a narrowing called the internal os. There is a clear demarcation of this transformation between the two types of epithelium called squamocolumnar junction. So, look at this picture. This is a columnar epithelium of the endocervical canal, and this is a stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix. This junction is called squamocolumnar junction. The position of the uterus in normal adults it can be described as antiverted with respect to the vagina and antiflexed with respect to the cervix other position as retroverted retroflexed the uterus normally lies posterior superior to the bladder and anterior to the rectum. This is the rectum, this is the uterus. The fundus and the body of the uterus are composed of three tissue layers. Peritoneum or called perimetrium. This is the outer covering of the uterus. It is double layered membrane continues with the abdominal peritoneum also known as perimetrium. Myometrium which is formed of six three layers of smooth muscle. This is the myometrium. Endometrium, inner mucus membrane lining of the uterus can be further divided into two parts deep stratum basalis and superficial stratum functionalis. And this functionalis is responsible for the cyclic changes in the endometrium and the response respond to the estrogen and the progesterone during the menstrual cycle. This is the endometrium with endometrial glands and this is the myometrium. 
The ligaments of the uterus include broad ligament, which is a double layer. This is a broad ligament, double layer of peritoneum attaching the side of the uterus to the pelvis. Around the ligament, which extend from the uterine hole to the labia majora by the inguinal canal. Ovarian ligament, this is our ovarian ligament, this is our ovarian ligament, join the ovaries to the uterus. Cardinal ligament, located at the base of the broad ligament, and extend from the cervix to the lateral pelvic wall give a strong support to the uterus. Uterus sacral ligament extend from the cervix to the sacrum on both sides here. So what about the benign lesions of the uterus? Benign lesion in the cervix may be cervical ectrobion, the butyl follicles, cervical polyps, cervical stenosis. Lesions in the endometrium include endometrial polyps and the Asherman syndrome. Lesion in the muscle wall of the uterus is adenomyosis and leomyoma. And we will cover all lesions during this lecture except leomyoma, which will be in a separate lecture. Cervical ectrobion can be defined as a columnar epithelium which is visible on the ectocervix as a circular red area surrounding the external cervical os in women of reproductive age. In this picture, this is the cervical ectrobion, the red circular area around the external os. An ectrobion commonly develops under the influence of puberty, oral pills, and the pregnancy due to fluctuation in the hormones. Clinical presentation may be asymptomatic one or in cases with large cervical ectrobion, the patient may present with pain at or after intercourse and uh, intermenstrual and postchital bleeding. Also, excessive clear and odorless mucus discharge. The treatment of cervical ectropion in symptomatic one and in cases with large ectropion include stop the combined oral pills containing estrogen. And the period to the treatment, try to do cervical swab to catch infection like chlamydia and other sexual transmitted disease. Also, cervical smear for cytology to exclude cervical CIN and malignancy. We can do cervical ablation. So the visible glandular producing columnar cells are ablated, usually with cricotery or electrocutery, as in this picture. This is the ablation of the cervix, and this is the swab, which should be done before ablation. What about Nabuthian follicles? It is a small mucus fold cyst, visible on this ectocervix. In this picture, this is an Nabuthian cyst, containing a mucus, which is white or yellowish in color. The columnar glands within the transformation zone become sealed over, forming this cyst. No pathological significance, and usually it is asymptomatic. No treatment is usually required for an apothecary follicles, although extremely large one can be drained using a large bore needle or by using electrocutary ablation. If Nabuthian cysts occur with chronic surfacitis, then the underlying cause of the inflammation must be treated. The same also for ectrobium. The underlying uh, or associated infection in the cervix, as in chronic surfacitis, should be treated according to the organism.
The next title is a cervical polyps, which is a benign tumor arising from the endocervical epithelium, and they may be seen as a smooth reddish protrusion, as this picture. This is the cervical polyps, mucus gland polyps. The clinical presentation of the patient may be in the form of vaginal discharge, interministerial bleeding, and post-tidal bleeding. However, many of the cases are asymptomatic, and this case discovered accidentally during local examination. Treatment are easily removed by avulsion with polyp forceps as an outpatient procedure. So we do polypectomy, an outpatient claim. The next is cervical stenosis, which is defined as pathological narrowing of the endocervical canal, which is caused by congenital causes, which is very rare, or acquired iatrogenic one. A surgical event as comb biopsy or loop dysarmy and endometrial ablation affecting the os, causing the injury to the os or cervical canal, as in the picture. The clinical presentation is due to trap the blood in the uterus, causing a hematometria, which will be associated with cyclic dysmenorrhea with no associated menstrual bleeding or very mild spotting. So, the treatment as in the picture by dilatation of the cervical canal under ultrasound guidance. Also, insertion of luminary tent or T-tube as a stent for few days. Next title is endometrial polyps, which is a common and estimated to be present in around 10 to 20 percent of women with abnormal uterine bleeding and 10 percent of women with subfertility. The risk factors include late menopause, obesity, hormone replacement surgery, and tamoxifen surgery. As you see in the picture, this is hysteroscopic view. The hysteroscope entered the uterine cavity, and this is the polyp seen inside. Endometrial polyps may be pedunculated as a pedicle, like this one, and this one, this is a pedicle, or a sisal. Single or multiple, this is multiple one, and this is multiple one. And vary in size between 0.5 to 4 cm. They are focal endometrial outgrowth containing a variable amount of glands, stroma, and blood vessels. They are relatively insensitive to cyclic hormonal changes. So it is not responding to shedding of the endometrium under the effect of hormone of the menstrual cycle or not responding also to hormonal treatment. The presentation of the patient with endometrial polyp may be asymptomatic or abnormally trying bleeding in the form of heavy menstrual bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, or postmenopausal bleeding. Or the patient presents with inability to conceive. Diagnosis went on history of abnormally trying bleeding and investigation by doing transvaginal ultrasound or saline infusion sonography and outpatient hysteroscopy. This is the saline infusion sonography and this is the saline injected in the uterine cavity making contrast and this is a polyp can be seen very well by transvaginal ultrasound. While in the other picture this is hysteroscopy and this is a polyp can be seen easily single polyp inside the uterine cavity. What is the complication? Endometrial polyps 
contain hyperplastic foci in 10 to 25 percent of symptomatic cases and one percent is frankly malignant this is very important the risk of polyps harboring serious endometrial disease is increased after menopause and with the use of tamoxifen so should be careful with postmenopausal lady with endometrial polyp and those get taking a treatment with tamoxifen this is the endometrial polyp here in the picture of the thrust the treatment include polypectomy in order to alleviate the abnormal trampeding symptoms optimize fertility and exclude hyperplasia or cancer we are using hysteroscopy for polypectomy it can visualize the polyp very well and remove it by scissor or electrodes under general or local anesthesia as you see in this picture this is after removal of the polyp the drum have to become free Next title is Escherman syndrome, which is defined as reversible damage of the single layer thick basal endometrium, which doesn't allow normal regeneration of the endometrium. The endometrial cavity undergo fibrosis and adhesion formation. The result is reduced or absent menstrual shedding and soft fertility. This usually occurs after pregnancy where there have been uterine infection or following overzealous keratage of the uterine cavity during surgical management of miscarriage or following secondary postpartum hemorrhage as you see in the picture this is the intrauterine adhesions what's called Asherman syndrome The clinical presentation includes secondary amenorrhea or hypomenorrhea and inability to conceive. Investigation to diagnose as history self angiogram, as in this picture, there is filling defect here due to intrauterine adhesions or hysteroscopy, as sick adhesions here can be seen very well inside the uterine cavity. Also, another adhesion, more thin adhesion. Here in the uterine cavity. Treatment by hysteroscopic adhesolysis by cutting these adhesions and inserting intrauterine balloon stent to prevent recurrence of the adhesion, as this one taking the shape of the uterine cavity triangular. This balloon try to prevent the adhesion inside the uterus again and they give the patient cyclic hormonal treatment estradiol and progestogen with high dose estradiol to help for regeneration of the epithelium of the endometrium next is adenomyosis which is defined as a disorder in which endometrial gland and the stroma are found deep within the myometrium as here in the picture this is the endometrium gland and enter the muscle wall of the uterus deeply adenomyosis can be definitively diagnosed following histopathological examination of hysterectomy specimen where it is identified in 40 percent if you try from general female population of reproductive age this ectopic endometrium is responsive to cyclical hormonal changes that result in bleeding within the myometrium, making the muscle wall sick, hyperplastic, and the fibrosis and tiny cyst in cut section can be seen inside the muscle wall of the uterus. And the uterus becomes bulky and enlarged symmetrically in diffuse adenomyosis and asymmetrically in focal adenomyosis. The risk factor include uterine trauma from childbirth or abortion, chronic endometritis or hyperesterogenism. The etiology include a widely accepted theory 
trying to explain the adenomyosis. Adenomyosis results from invagination of Bezalus endometrium into the myometrium through an altered or interrupted junctional zoom. Differential diagnosis of adenomyosis includes other causes of symmetrically or asymmetrically enlarged uterus. Adenomyosis occur in the age of late 30 or early 40. Symptoms include dysmenorrhea, the heavy menstrual bleeding, examination reveal bulky and the tender uterus fault, uh, particularly uh, in the perimenstrual period. Ultrasound examination can diagnose adenomyosis very well. Either focal or diffuse adenomyosis can be identified. Also, we can see different signs of by ultrasound like myometrial cyst or asymmetric sickness of the anterior and posterior wall or heterogeneous heterogeneity of the muscle wall of the uterus as in this picture by ultrasound. MRI is investigation of a choice with high accuracy in diagnosis of adenomyosis but it is expensive. It provides excellent image of the myometrium, endometrium and the areas of adenomyosis. Different sonographic signs of adenomyosis by transvaginal ultrasound. This is the asymmetric thickness of the anterior roll and the posterior roll. We can see the difference. This is diffuse posterior roll adenomyosis. Also, the heterogeneous echogenicity of the muscle wall of the uterus, myometrial cyst, poor definition of the endometrial myometrial junction, subendometrial echogenic linear striation. Regularly enlarged uterus and or asymmetric uterus unrelated to leomyoma. The treatment uh, of adenomyosis include medical treatment by giving the patient non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and hormonal treatment like progestin medications, norestrone acetate and dinogest, levonorgestrel enterotrine system, Mirena, as is this picture. It releases hormone progestogen inside the uterine cavity. Debopropera injection monthly. Or GnRH agonist like Zoladex subcutaneous injection 3.6 mg every month for 3 months. As in this picture, this is Zoladex. Treatment by surgical one. Include either Aggressive treatment like hysterectomy in patient above 40 and completed her family with severe symptoms, the definitive treatment would be hysterectomy. As one of my cases of adenomyosis, I did hysterectomy and the bilateral salpingo for this case. The other option is conservative surgical options, including endometrial ablation or stroscopic endometrial and adenomyoma resection or laparoscopic resection of adenomyosis or high intensity focused ultrasonography for lysis of adenomyosis or uterine artery embolization. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alamos Bah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University.